the foundation of any relationship and, and, and the starting point really in a lot of ways is trust, right? Is how do you build trust with this person? And, you know, we're in an environment today where trust in institutions, in companies, in nonprofits is at an all-time low, right? And so if you have a message that you want to get out and you are trying to communicate that message through a corporate logo or an institutional logo or a nonprofit logo, you got an audience that's more skeptical of that message than they've ever been. So what we want to do is show them, hey, you can take these ideas that you're sharing behind the scenes, you could do it at scale and in the process, make a bigger impact. But but maybe as importantly, Scott, is you sort of shift the market perception from, all right, this is an operator with something to sell to really where we want leaders to be positioned, which is. You talk about putting the ego away and and making an impact tell me about the authority advantage tell me about impact in your life and, and what really puts you on this path yeah well just to to talk a little bit about kind of that subtitle which i i agree is my favorite piece of it so this idea of how do you go out and build thought leadership focused on impact not ego and one of the things i found through my career scott is uh some of the the most established, most effective leaders that, that I know, servant leaders, people that are committed to over-delivering for their team, for their clients, et cetera. You know, typically what I found from them is this kind of heads down behind the scenes approach and mindset. And, you know, for many years, that has been sort of the ethos of servant leadership is you are behind the scenes, serving your team, serving your clients. And, and by the way, obviously that's table stakes still today. You have to do that. But what I found is that for many of those servant leaders, when I would encourage them, hey, there's a lot of people that could benefit from your message. There's a lot of people that you can make an impact on beyond those that are lucky enough to be in the boardroom with you or have direct contact. But when I bring up the phrase thought leadership or personal branding, I get like a visible grimace from that kind of leader, right? It's, the, it's, it's you know, their minds are immediately going to where some of your audience's minds might be going to, which is this kind of ego stroke, hey, look at me kind of approach. And so what we wanted to do with this book is is kind of grab that servant leader by the shoulders and, and, and sort of show them that if they are staying behind the scenes with their message, that they're costing two groups of people. Number one, they're costing their team because if all they're doing is behind the scenes, they're limiting the ability to go out and build trust on behalf of the organization. And then number two, the only people benefiting from their message are those in physical contact with them. And so what we want to do with this book is show them, hey, you can take these ideas that you're sharing behind the scenes, you could do it at scale and in the process, make a bigger impact. But but maybe as importantly, Scott, is you sort of shift the market perception from, all right, this is an operator with something to sell to really where we want leaders to be positioned, which is, you know, we want them seen as a mission-driven thought leader with something to teach. And so that was kind of the idea with the book is let's give really good behind the scenes servant leaders permission and a bit of a mindset shift to go out and, and, and make an impact at more scale. Yeah, it really is hard. I, I think that it's interesting because I've been challenged personally throughout the years on, on the messaging, oh. what I share, what I don't share, what feels like bragging, what feels like success sharing and what really is just about stories. And sometimes mm -hmm. you feel like you're almost hiding a piece of yourself when um, you there's more to the story. And the more you the share, the more people are actually attached to the story. And it's a very it's a it's a natural challenge, though. I know, like even like the everyday stuff, I find mm -hmm. myself really enjoying some of the behind the scenes and everyday things from the people I like to follow and the mentors that I've that I've followed and people that are close friends that I admire. That's my favorite thing to watch and learn from. And yet I struggle to do that myself. It, it is. It's it's one of those things, Scott, and I find for, for a lot of leaders is just really understanding that um, people people want to get to know you at scale. And the, the thing that actually works, I, I find a lot of people as they take this step forward, it's like, all right, I got to play this formal thought leader role or I got to be this super professional suit and tie. And as you know, the, the opposite is really what works. I mean, the only reason to listen to Josh Brown's, uh, the Compound and Friends podcast versus the thousands of other financial podcasts out there is that, you know, he brings his personality to the table and, and, and rapport building and authenticity. And so I think that's a huge, huge 
part of it. The other piece, Scott, just for leaders to get clear on is whether you like it or not, whether you like social media or not, whether you want to have a personal brand or not, the first impression people are getting of you when they're referred to you, when they move in next door to you, when they've got a kid on the soccer team that you're coaching, they're Googling your name. And so whether you like it or not, the first impression they're getting is is online. And so my encouragement for your audience is like, all right, if it's happening, whether you like it or not, number one, don't you want to own that first impression? And then number two, don't you want to be really intentional about creating an image, again, not of somebody with something to sell or somebody on an ego trip, but instead, you know, somebody that's on a mission to help people, right? Somebody with something to teach. And so that's really what the book's about. And we've had a lot of fun with it, but I think that's the, um, you know, as I was kind of getting to know you ahead of this podcast, I was super impressed with just the, the kind of combination that you have of, all right, you know, feature the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, all of the kind of third party authority by association, which builds trust. But, but then you really lean into to some stuff that I don't see from a lot of leaders, which is, you know, a lot of vulnerability. I mean, the story about the babysitter when you were three years old, the, um, you, you know, some of the other things that I saw around coaching soccer, and I'll, hopefully we'll get to some soccer in this interview as well. But that combination I find is, is it, it really is something that not only makes an impact, but really gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace when, when people see the experience and reputation and third-party credibility, and, and then this is actually somebody I feel like I, I would enjoy you know, having a beer with or, or hanging out with. And so that combination, I think you've done a good job with. Thank you. I, I, uh, I was telling you pre-show that uh, when I was reading the bio, learning everything about you, I'm like, okay, there's so many things I, I want to fix. You know, when you're an entrepreneur and you're always working at building something better, you're constantly evaluating how you, you have a vision of where you want to go and you're working towards that vision, but it's usually not quite there yet. And so um, I was reading, I was like, okay, good. I'll, I'll gain some, some good insight. I'll get some information. We'll, we'll uh, learn about each other. But you know, when you think about it, I really believe that everything in life from business to, uh, to just family to anything that we do is about building quality relationships. No. And I don't believe that a quality relationship can be built on falsehoods and fake and things that that aren't real and authenticity <laughs> matters. And so if you understand who I am today, sometimes it's also good for you to understand who I was <laughs> and why I work to get better at these things or how this trauma impacted me and why it now helps shape how I do things in my life. These are things that help you relate to me and help our audience see that we are right where we're supposed to be. Even if it's a challenging time, we are right where we need to be mm -hmm. and we can build from here. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And and when you talk about life being about building relationships and, and, and making an impact through those relationships, which I totally agree with, the foundation of any relationship and, and the starting point really in a lot of ways is trust, right? Is how do you build trust with this person? And I think the other interesting thing, just to kind of take it back to business for a second is, you know, we're in an environment today, Scott, as you know, where trust in institutions, in companies, in nonprofits is at an all-time low, right? And so the people that are listening to this podcast, if you have a message that you want to get out and you are trying to communicate that message through a corporate logo or an institutional logo or a nonprofit logo, you've got an audience that's more skeptical of that message than they've ever been. So the, the other piece that I would just encourage them on in terms of motivation to, to take that step forward and, and, and get a bit more visible, visible individually is the speed to trust for you as, as the leader is dramatically quicker than it is for your company. And so if, you, if you're wanting to make that impact, grow that visibility, et cetera, you're going to go a lot further, a lot cheaper, a lot more effectively if you are willing to be the messenger, not the message. So, so when we're talking about your message, let's talk a little bit about yourself just so we can get a background. You have three children, two boys and a girl. You've been married for a good amount of time now. You've got a great family, which as I did my research, you know, most of the pictures on social media are of you and your family enjoying. Do, do the kids play soccer? Is that the connection? Do you love soccer? Where's the, uh, where's the time spent? Man, I grew up playing soccer. I played 15 years of soccer. Uh, coming up all the way through high school. And despite all of my best efforts, Scott, I could not get 
any of the kids interested in soccer. In other words, I, I had them doing it early on. My oldest jumped into, um, you know, outdoorsy stuff and FFA and hunting and all of that. And my youngest is uh, baseball and then now golf. So he and I have that in common. And then my youngest, I'm still working on with soccer, but I've enjoyed, similar to you, enjoyed coaching. One of the greatest joys of, of my life is doing this. I grew up here in Austin, Texas, um, married my high school sweetheart. Uh, both of us went to the University of Texas. I've lived here my whole life ever since, you know, it was kind of hippie college town way back in the day. And now, you know, we all know what kind of Austin's become. So it's a really different place. Um, but put down the roots here. My my whole family's here and and really built, you know, kind of my career got through the the book marketing industry. So I started out as an intern at a book PR agency in Austin, Texas, way back in 2001. And when I graduated in 03, I started out as a publicist. And so my job is somebody wrote a book and they hired our firm. My job was to make 50 phone calls a day in cold call producers and try to charm them into having our authors on the air. So kind of the old school PR is where I cut my teeth, jumped out and started my first agency in 2010, uh, which was called Shelton Interactive. And we at that time, kind of pulled everything that authors would normally hire out to multiple vendors. So PR, website, social media, we pulled it under one roof. As common as that feels now, wasn't common back in 2010. And so we built that. We're fortunate enough to be acquired by Advantage Media Group Forbes Books back in 2016. Uh, and I still do a lot of work with with them and then now have a, a new agency called Zilker Media. And we're kind of taking everything that we learned about thought leadership for authors and applying it to CEOs, to financial advisors, to attorneys, and, and kind of this idea that you're going to go further and more effectively today by teaching rather than marketing yourself. Yeah. It's interesting. Years ago, John Maxwell, the <laughs> the uh, the leadership guru and sure. expert in the space, he had a uh, coaching program that he launched and I was a, a part of the early days in it. And I, I, I loved learning from John and I, I found myself in the coolest scenarios. Uh, the first year I went, uh, I went with a buddy of mine who I had just met. We were going to room together. We were all kind of like struggling, trying to figure it out. And uh, okay. so we had this group of five guys and we all roomed within two rooms and shared details. At the end of the day, it was really this growth mentality. <laughs> the point is um, he stood up and gave like this testimony in the, in the Maxwell, the first day of the coaching meeting. And he said, Hey, th this is the story. And uh, this is how I wrote a book on how uh, I spent one day with John Maxwell. And he, he wrote a book, launched it and then, and put it out there. So John's uh, John's writer, the guy who pulls all of his stuff together, uh -huh. writes all of his stuff, his, uh, his uh, longtime assistant who had, uh, I think her name was Linda. I may be wrong, but she was, uh, she and him and invited us two to dinner because we were sitting together so we end up going to dinner and i start learning all about the publishing industry and like how they publish john's books and what they do and this was at the turning point when self-publishing was becoming something different and they were really you know evaluating like how they were going to continue and john has like something like not, i mean 90 something books 100 right. books at this point in time and there's a new one almost every year and so uh, i was so fascinated at, at the at the game but getting that insight, the point is how the game has changed so dramatically in the last decade is unbelievable. And I, and obviously you've not only navigated it, but you've been extremely successful at at growing with it. Um, and it's it's obvious by the success of your of your company, of your books, and and what you put out into the world. Man, it's it, it is it's it's amazing how much has shifted. You look at somebody like John Maxwell, um, you know the impact that he has made through the years, through all of those books, through all of those speaking engagements. Imagine if if he had sort of just leaned into kind of the old school servant leadership behind the scenes mentality. There's so many people that would have missed out on that. But publishing as a whole, I mean, back when I started my career, we actually had board, you remember Borders and, and physical yeah. bookstores that we still have a couple of them today. But um, it was just such a different game because back then a book had to move in the first month, it had to go off the shelves. And if it didn't move in the first month, all those books were coming back to the publisher because everything was in Barnes and Noble and Borders on consignment. Fast forward to where we are today, obviously you want as much launch week buzz as you can get, but the long tail of books on, on Amazon and beyond is significant. And you could have a book take off four, five, six years after it came out, 
uh, where that just didn't exist before. And so I love it for authors. I, I talked to some authors, Scott, that are super frustrated. He was like, all right, back in the day, my publisher used to do everything for me. And I could kind of sit back and just do the interviews. And now the author is the brand, of course. But the flip side of that is, as an author, you can actually earn it today, whereas before you had to hope other people got it done for you. Yeah, I think that's great. It goes right into your messaging too, because I think a lot of people have a book in them. I think a lot of people have a story they don't think is worth sharing. And it it, it goes right into your, again, the point you were making earlier about impact. And um, I was having a conversation, one of my uncles who had no idea that I have a, a YouTube channel or that I you know, have a podcast. We were talking about things that he was listening to and reading. And he was talking about somebody. And I said, oh, you know, I just interviewed this uh, Green Beret. And uh, he was amazing, super, you'd, you'd really enjoy him. He spent a long time in the military mm -hmm. and it's his kind of forte. And um, he was like, where, where'd you interview him? And I was like, oh, I have this podcast. And he's like, what, what do you mean you have a podcast? And so I start telling him and he asked me a question that was really interesting. He said, are you doing this to become famous? And I said, no, not at, I mean, like it was immediate. I was like, no, yeah. not at all. I said, there's, there's probably two or three things that stand out to me. Right. Number one, the number one reason I, I create content is because I want my sons and anybody that's been a part of my life to know who I was, what I did and what I stood for. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm gone tomorrow, my boys can literally look Jeez. And watch me and watch me respond. Watch me talk about failures. Watch me talk about things that have happened in my life that I'm not proud of or things that I am proud of and and how I overcame that. And I think that, man, to have a picture of that, of your, of your parents or of your grandparents or to be able to go backwards and really know who that person was, I feel like is empowering. And, and the other big one is your point. And that is, I'm shocked at how many times I get a text or an email or a quick voice message from somebody that's listening yeah. and they're telling me that it impacted their life. Something I said, something that, that, that yeah. I did or I showed or I read and, um, and I shared with someone and, and people that you wouldn't even expect. And you know how guys, guys are right. Like no. sure. they don't, they're not going to like anything on social media. They're not going to actually show anyone that they follow you, but they'll send you a little side text every once in a while and be like, yo, I listen to your stuff, dude. Keep doing it because I really appreciate it. And at the end of the day, the impact you're talking about is real, but everybody has that story in them. That's right. Everybody does. And, and what the the thing that I get excited about, Scott, is if, if you can get somebody over that initial self-talk or that initial misperception of what this actually is and, and get them to where they actually are diving in, whether it's a podcast or a LinkedIn newsletter or a book or whatever it might be, that text, when it comes through four months after that podcast starts or, you know, eight months after the book's been out, I mean, that is such fuel to, to just keep doing it and expand it and you just reach more people along the way. So, um, you know, that's the fun part of it. And, and I guess I'm curious for you, Scott, so you, you know, you published a book a couple of years back. Um, a lot of leaders have it on their to-do list, right? It's been there for maybe a decade or two. And I'm curious for you, number one, kind of the initial decision when you finally said, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to sit down and write it. Uh, what was the spark? And then number two, um, what was your process like with the book? Was it something that, um, you know, was it an early morning thing? Did you have a certain coffee shop? What did that look like for you? Yeah. So there's two things I think that are important. Number one, um, I saw a problem in the industry that I was in, in the financial services industry and the average advisor in my space is 62 years old and they had no succession plan and no step down. And you know what they mainly don't have is they don't have an impact that goes beyond their career. Yep. So many people, it's not just that career, by the way, so many people put their entire lives into their job. And then when they retire, they've got nothing left. And so that was the problem that I started to solve in my brain. And I said, you know what? I need to get a message out there and I need to do it where I'm not telling people something. And it started out as a book for financial advisors. And um, the process will lead into the, 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 the second part of your question. I am, I'm not a good sit down and writer, writer. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a talker, I'm a communicator. So I hired um, Scribe Media at the time and I worked with a, an editor and a writer and they, we basically recorded all of my conversations and I would get my words back 
in 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 edited form and they were rough and they were rocky and then we would put together the editing it was a lot of like working together but you build this rapport with another human you have a great time i honestly really enjoyed the process and the the third part that i would say that was really interesting to me is that um i was supposed to launch the book in march of 2020 and oh, um well yeah and so uh revenue has just plummeted the biz i'm like the market's going crazy the business is going like not in a positive spot in march and i'm like you know what i feel like it's insensitive to to launch something right now and really what it was is i was nervous about the uh, i was nervous about exactly what we're talking about right now i i was nervous about how i'd be received Yep. If I had ended up sharing a lot more in this book, it was more, it turned out to be more of my story with a little bit of how I've seen this problem. And, and I really, I, when I did this book, I also did a lot of sub chapters on purpose. So I created all these sub chapters because I wanted to see what resonated with, with the audience. And I took an approach that said, this is book one. So Love it. I want to see what people like in book one, yeah. what stands out. And in book one, the four quadrants was something I've been using my whole life. It's now the high performance life model. Mm -hmm. And that was the number one thing that I took out of the book that was this big in the book, but it was a big impact. And when I, somebody finally, the last thing I'll say, and um, is it, I think it was super interesting is somebody told me a fact about the number of people that actually complete a book. And um, I, I, I want to say, uh, I was at a Genius Network event. It was one of the writers. I think uh, Sivers is, is the last name, and I can't remember his first name. He writes these little small books. Okay. And uh, and God, he's such an amazing writer. But but uh, he's like nobody reads past like sixty six pages. And I remember sitting in the room going, most people aren't even going to read this. They're going to buy it because they support me. They're going to buy it because the message sounds good. It's going to collect dust on their on their bookshelf, then the people that read it are going to gain impact. How can I not put this out? And I immediately went back, re-edited mm -hmm. it and got it out in, in, a, in a quick version. And the process was awesome. I mean, it, and that that whole system blew up. They they changed leadership. That company yeah. went, went, you know, had a had a really rough run. I don't know where <laughs> they're at right now, but I, I know that it was a good process for me. And then I was shocked, shocked at how much we had to actually do so I genuinely did not realize internally, I mean, I was on like 30, 40 podcasts right out of the gate. Yep. I was, I, you know, you're, you are, you are hustling yep. and, um, and it's fun. Like I enjoyed that part, but it was an interesting dynamic and mm. it's, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like back pain. If you've ever had severe back pain and it's like sciatic nerve pain going down your legs and you see someone walking with that, with, you can almost just know yes. you're like. Oh man, that guy's struggling. You empathize at such a level of depth that you immediately want to help that person any way that you can. Yep. Well, now when I see a buddy of mine, every time I have a guest, if you wrote a book, I'm bringing your book. I'm buying your book. I, my goal is to write a write a, uh, a review of your book. You know all the things that I, you know, really fought to get. Yeah. I now want to give, and it's because I have this understanding, and so it's um. It, it's definitely something that I find really powerful, but it, it's it's a great question. Yeah, it, and and you know that process you mentioned with publisher you went with is it, uh, one that I see a lot of leaders go with. So Forbes Books Advantage, who bought my first agency, they have been doing that similar process for you know many years. It's kind of this idea for leaders that number one, uh, you, you know, investing two hundred hours of your time in writing a book versus. 20 to 30 with a great ghostwriter is probably not a great trade-off. Um, and, and so if you can work with somebody that can take your ideas and then bring them to life, it's just such an efficient way to get it done. And, um, you know, I see for a lot of leaders that book becomes just a fantastic on-ramp back to the business, chance to make an impact, opportunity to get, you know, into the podcast space and do a lot of those interviews. So people that are listening to this, that are thinking about, hey, you know, it, it could really differentiate me in the marketplace, but I just got this message that I want to get out. I'd encourage them, whether it's Forbes books or somebody else, just to take a look at, uh, you know, somebody that can help you bring it to life. The other big thing, Scott, just that you run through there on the on the book side is seeing whether it's a podcast interview or a blog or a book as the starting point. It's not the end of the road because 
it really becomes one of those things that over time you build an audience that wants to keep learning from you, right? They want to keep getting that. And so I, I think that's really, really an important part of it as well. Yeah, you have to be willing to fail at anything you do. Yes. And so the one thing is, this is book one. I I can go, go to any actor, go to any writer, go to any creative and find the first thing that they did and put out into the world and tell me that they don't think that they're way better today. Yes. At the end of the day, I had to get over that too. You, It couldn't be the perfect book. It had to be something that eventually you know, I, I put out there into the world and just let it, let, let it see where surrender to what happens and, um, and not be held to the result, but really be held to, did I feel good about the work? Almost like you hear actors, they'll say, I love this movie. And it, it wasn't very popular, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's one of my favorite movies, it's almost like those, those, uh, those movies that nobody, nobody yeah. sees when they first come out and then they become like cult classics yeah. like the Stanley Tucci movie where it's him uh -huh. and the brother in the in the Italian restaurant and they're and uh and now it's it's like the famous restaurant movie that everybody watches but when it came out it wasn't really a good movie yeah. at all so um at least that's yeah. what you know people would say I'll use my air quotes here yeah right now did it did the book buy you some respect from your sons in, in other words when you got the physical copy and you put it down in front of them were they like wow dad you got it done or was it like I, you know what? I got two. You have two boys and a girl. I, I have not had the, uh, uh, I, I, I need the daughter for that, uh, that level of, of grace. I don't yeah. have the daughter. Um, I, I definitely, I also downplayed it a lot internally with my family. I downplayed it a lot. I, I was really, really, um, humble and, sure. and kind of almost nervous about pushing it out there, making anybody feel like all the things you said, like I yeah. struggled with the process. And so I don't know the boys really said much. I think what I get the most satisfaction out of with my boys who are 17 and 14, they'll be 18 and 15 in a, in a month and a half or so. Wow. Um, I think the most satisfaction I get is I do um, a lot of shorts, <laughs> a lot of video, a lot of uh, cuts from the podcast. And every once in a while, they'll like one or they'll share one. And even uh -huh. better is their friends will send me a DM or comment their buddies from their soccer team or their friends will like it that are that are, I know like young people that are following my message that I'm I you know your children are listening <laughs> you know you know they're li they're not always showing you they're listening but they're listening yeah and but seeing other people that they hang out with listen yeah is probably a better um benefit and and so yeah. you know uh, uh, having almost 15 and 18 year old there there's not, there's a lot of they're at the the age right now where it's more they're becoming men where men just joke on each other constantly and that's how no we show each other love mm -hmm. so you, how about so do your boys get along uh yeah, do, how, yes they do now okay. and uh but i i will say this you love soccer my youngest son is playing for uh one of the academies okay. here um in the u.s oh, and, very has, cool. and has moved away my youngest son oh. and my oldest yeah. son <laughs> Yeah. is staying at home and he's going on to play division one soccer next year in college. And he, when, when my youngest son moved away, the they've always been close, but they fought a lot, but they've always been close since he moved away. It's a whole new relationship. I mean, oh, I'm wow. so proud of how close they are, how much they communicate, how often they call each other. Um, you know, we, we make a major effort to go back and forth to see each other's games. And even if it's uncomfortable, the travel's very difficult or, or, uh, challenging. And so, uh, my oldest son had two games this past weekend. I was up to watch a scrimmage for my youngest son, drove down, brought my youngest son back home. He watched two games of my son Saturday and Sunday. And then my wife drove up and back Monday to make sure she took off of work and, and, wow. and took care of that. And that's. That's the kind of sacrifice. So I bring that up because I think they're seeing the sacrifice we're making as parents <laughs> and they're really getting closer. Um, and that's nice. How about your kids? What do you, that's what great. do you find with your, what do you so find with your boys? My boys are, are, are kind of at each other's throats. have been that way for a while. I mean, they have their moments and they're 14 and 16. And so okay. I think they're, they will get there. I know, you know, when my oldest ends up going off to college, my youngest, it probably does become a, a inflection point with their relationship. I was just curious. It, uh, it totally will. 
Rusty, yeah. it totally. I'm, there's no doubt in my mind. I think the oldest has a. First of all, the youngest always wants to be like his older brother. Yep. There's this, and the older brother, if they're anything like my oldest son, he's gonna push that younger brother down constantly. And so there is this tension, but it's very natural, very mm -hmm. normal. Yep. But when when we reverse the order and the youngest went away first, it almost I feel oh, like it flipped a, a big switch, and he first. saw for the first time what it's like. Like I I don't know that he really wanted to be the only child in the house. I don't yep. think he wanted to be, you know that that uh, that person. So I I think your boys will uh, will will find that. How do they? How, are they both protective of their sister? Are they both like? Uh, or does she also does she have a little bit of tension with the with the middle child? No, she's she's kind of running the show as you might expect. So <laughs> she just turned eight. She's um, she's definitely been raised by by two boys, so she's all over the place. But um, it's it's been good, you know. It's been a good, really good dynamic, and it's been fun. The boys being old enough to kind of go along for the ride. If I go off and 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 give a talk somewhere, um, I'll try to bring one of them with me and. Uh, you know, just have them along for the ride, which I think has been, been fun at this phase of, of my career, just to be able to involve them a little bit more. And so uh, that side of it's been, been great. So no have, complaints. Have, have you with the soccer, the love for soccer, how often are you guys getting to Austin FC games? Well, so I've only been to one game so far, which I'm disappointed in myself. It's, it's kind of 45 minutes from the house. So we're out just West of town. But man, it's been so close. Our first professional team here in Austin. Austin's like the tenth or eleventh biggest city in the U.S. And you know, as a as a proud Texas Longhorn, I would call you know the Longhorns our, our kind of professional team, and probably still today. But the first official professional team in the FC. I mean, Skybox is sold out. Every game is sold out, and I think a lot of pro leagues are sort of watching what's happened with them and say, okay, Austin's ripe for. Major League Baseball. Jerry Jones is never going to let us have an NFL team here in Austin, but I'm hoping we might could get a, a major league team at some point. Yeah, I mean, look, the, what I would say is the the soccer thing, that's how you get your kids to love something that you love, even if they don't play it. I'm shocked at going to these games, how many young people are there mm -hmm. and how, they're imp how that's impacting the crowd and the audience and how they interact with each other and – you know, you're, you're old school Austin, so you got to just find that connection to Matthew yeah. McConaughey, that UT connection to McConaughey. No Get out there. He's out there banging a drum at the Austin FC games, and uh, it looks like a really cool experience. It is. I mean, the, the atmosphere there is is insane. And, you know, McConaughey is the minister of culture at, at University of Texas and certainly has done plenty of that for FC, but he's a he's just a, a fantastic brand ambassador for for Austin and, and each of those teams that we just mentioned. So. It's a fun place. Do you ever get down to Austin? No, I've never been to Austin. So of really? all the places, I have a couple of really good buddies that are there right now. They they have been begging me to come. And uh, I've been to Dallas a bunch. I've been a Cowboys fan my whole life. So, okay. um, so my dad was a Cowboys right. fan. So we we go to we've been to Dallas, you know, once a year for several okay. years to go to games. I've been taking my oldest son. Awesome. Um, the last couple of years, my youngest son doesn't care so much about football. He likes soccer way more, but the oldest is, is eight up. So, uh, my brother, uh, is 31 and we both like every couple, we, we go through, what are the cities we haven't been to that we want to uh -huh. go to? And then we, we try to figure out how we're going to get out there and go do something fun. And so that's something we talked about, but we got to come out. And if we come out, we were going to do that for his bachelor party when he got married a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, but it was such a. A long trek we ended up doing charlotte instead okay. we're in virginia beach area so sure. you know it was, it was little five hour drive versus the flight and uh and we did charlotte <laughs> fc soccer and we did kind of the similar experience but it was just uh yeah we got to get out to austin and and uh and do that but that i feel like that's the uniter for your kids like it's one of those things where if you could build experiences around that it sounds like you do a lot of that with hunting and fishing and yep and the boys, you guys do, do yeah, you guys fishing. do guy trips? Fishing's fishing is kind of the key thing for them. Okay. They both just, you know, over the top love. So is we that made that is? a big focus. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you, now you got, what kind of fishing do you guys do? Well, so we've got, uh, we do a lot of freshwater fishing just around Austin and then we'll get down to the coast uh, outside of Port Aransas. Uh, we do a lot of saltwater fishing. That's been something we've leaned a little bit more into the last few years. And it's fun. You never know what's coming out of the water you know, when something bites. So it's, it's a little more adrenaline on, on that side of it. Now, um, 
<laughs> with things. your impact, how do you, uh, you mentioned, you mentioned one of the things that you do, which is you bring your son, a son with you when you go to travel or how, uh, how, what are other ways that you intertwine your love, your family, mm -hmm. the people that you care about into your career? You've been successful for many years. You obviously travel a bit. You do some really good good gigs. Yeah. What are some of the things that, and, and maybe from the relationship standpoint with your wife, what are some of the things that you guys do where you intertwine this stuff? Anything that, that we could share with the listeners? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to take both of my sons as much along for the ride kind of behind the scenes with the running of the business as well. And so, you know, we talk through P&Ls, we talk through strategic moves that we're making with the business. And, um, you know, my partner, uh, Paige Velasquez, buddy here at Zilker Media, will do a good job also of when I bring them up here, kind of talking them through stuff. So I'm trying to give them as much of a um, passenger seat view of the ups and downs of entrepreneurship and uh, lessons that I'm learning along the way. So I try to really involve them as much as I can in that. So, so that's a really big thing. One of the cool things about having a PR and marketing agency also, Scott, is just on the impact side, um, the thing that we can give to local nonprofits is uh, it is, is something that oftentimes is really valuable to them. So every quarter we pick out a different nonprofit and we donate uh, PR and marketing around their big fundraiser event. So we'll go to local media and help them get exposure for it. We'll help them think through a referral marketing strategy to get people in the door to the gala, et cetera. And so uh, that's a cool thing because those are organizations that, you know, that insight and that help is a lot more valuable to them than just a straight donation from us. And, and we found that to be a really good way to serve our community here in the Austin area. So we've done that uh, as well for, for many, many years. And then, you know, just again, kind of the message of the book, the thing that I just personally uh, passionate about and that drives me is just helping leaders to, to have that mindset shift and understand there's a way to do this where you're focused in on impact and not ego. And what I find, Scott, is that the more that I speak and the more that I teach on that, each individual, if I get one or two people in that audience to spin up and and get out and start doing that, it is a huge butterfly effect that happens from that. So that's what I'm personally really most passionate about is speaking, teaching workshops, et cetera. Yeah, I heard Ed Milet talk about this um, on, on one of the podcasts that I was listening to, and he talked about how his father was an alcoholic who um, became <laughs> sober and then helped a lot of people. <laughs> And Ed said he woke up one morning and and he had this like crazy thought that somebody helped his dad. Mm -hmm. And that person that helped his dad, that one person impacted not only his father's life, all the other lives that were affected and oh. saved from addiction, oh. but also yeah. Ed's life, the impact Ed's making in the world. Ed's yeah. making it with his, with his podcast, with his messaging, with his, and it's such a, small thing but such a large impact yeah. and you're right if one person is is uh impacted from that messaging or from that community support or any of that it's such a big benefit and it, it makes working kind of fun like it makes working oh, knowing that it's Absolutely. much bigger than you yeah and i would say that's the other thing i try to coach into the boys in you know in our daughter sadie is just this idea that your career and you know your work if you've leaned into the stuff that you just enjoy doing you know entrepreneurship is such a great bridge to build a life that you love and, and a life that gives you freedom and a life that allows you to make a bigger impact when you can sort of intersect with what you love doing and and, and what you know there's a market for in terms of people that need it so that's been the other thing is just really trying to coach them up on, hey, you can do this and there's a way to actually create a, a life that you don't have to wait until wait, you know, way late in life to get to what you want to do is do it right out of the gate with just a little bit of a shift in mindset. What do you what do you believe um, with with young people? You know, how would you encourage your children to write their first book? Like at what point in time would you tell? Would you tell them that it's a good idea? You know, if they were, if they, you've been doing this your whole life and, mm -hmm. and your, your son comes to you and he says, dad, I think I want to write a book. Do you say, well, what are you going to write it about? Or do you, do you know, what, it, what is your process there? And how do you develop that within the, within someone young? Um, because I think there's a lot of people that want to build that kind of confidence in their children into the yeah. future. And it's an interesting dynamic there. 
Well, he, here's what I always suggest, Scott, and this is something for people listening to this. If you've got a college age kid or a high school kid or somebody that's just out of college that, you know, is, is trying to figure out exactly what they want to do. Um, my favorite thing to do on the writing front early on, Scott, is to do what we call relationship driven content. So, um, you know, for example, if, if I'm talking to a college class and, you know, there's somebody in that class that wants to uh, get a job at a top engineering firm, let's say just for example, that's their goal right after college, get a job at, a, at an engineering firm. Well, what's the process that 99 out of 100 students are going to take? They're, they're going to print up a resume. They're going to push that resume out. And, you know, most of the places that they're pushing that resume to can't delete it quickly enough because they're just overloaded. What I always encourage college kids to think about, and, and people listening to this also to, to think about, is flip it. And instead of thinking like a marketer and trying to sell somebody something or sell yourself, flip it. And instead, what if you identified in the city that you wanted to live in the top 20 engineering firms? Again, if that's the example. Um, and of those engineering firms, if you could identify who those CEOs were, who's, who, are, who are the people running those companies? Your senior year in college, Go to those 20 engineering CEOs and start a LinkedIn newsletter where you're profiling engineering CEOs. And when you reach out to that CEO, it's not, hey, I'm about to graduate. You know, do you have any open spots? It is, hey, I'm doing a spotlight series on people that have built market-leading engineering firms. I've been so impressed with the job you've done with XYZ Engineering. Would it be possible for me to grab 30 minutes of your time on a Zoom or, or buy you a cup of coffee. I'd love to interview you and then share with my classmates some of your lessons learned along the way. Well, you know, you're going to hear back from a large percentage of those CEOs. Many of them are going to give time and insight. And what I found, Scott, is that those people then want to turn around and many of them reciprocate or, or look for opportunities to open doors for you. At the worst, you're going to learn a ton. And so, I always encourage, I mean, similar to what, you know, many people think about with their podcasts is sort of building bridges, building relationships with people. But early on in their career, it's something I did before I started my first business. I thought among my parents' friends, who were the, the five most successful entrepreneurs? And I bought each one of them lunch. And, and I just sat down and said, I have no idea what I'm doing. Please, you know, share with me everything I need to know. And you get so much great insight from people, um, but a lot of them open doors for me early in my career. It's a shortcut. It's such a shortcut. And you know, it's it's it can be lonely for those leaders. And so when someone's actually interested in their life, in their career, they're so excited to talk about it and they're so excited to share. Very seldom are they going to say no. Most good. And, and you know what? The ones that do say no, you probably don't want to work for. Correct. It's the ones that say yes, that you're like, that's a good guy. He's willing to give back. He's willing to learn. She's willing to learn. She's willing to give back. And I've always found in those mentorship roles, those mentorship positions, I end up gaining more out of those sit downs than the kid gets yeah. if that actually happens. And that's the most interesting thing is that when you have this, uh, this mental mindset of growth, you're sitting down with someone yeah. and you're actually feeding them the information they need but you're gaining so much more than they even understand in that setup. For sure. For sure. And it's just, it, it, it builds such great rapport and you learn so much. And so I would encourage any young person that it, even if they don't know exactly what they want to do, if they know they want to start a business at some point, well, you know, your interview series is going to focus on, on entrepreneurs. If you know you want to go in XYZ industry, start there and, uh, when you do that with some with some humility, uh, it's, it, it opens so many doors uh, for people. So that's what I would coach my my uh, kids to do down the road. If they said, "Hey, Dad, I want to write. I want to write a book. How do I do it?" I'd probably uh, pair them up with somebody at you know Advantage Force Books with a ghostwriter, or I'd help them get into kind of the process of write a little bit every day. Don't overthink. Just get words on a page and and edit from there. I bet the power of journaling, something that um, something as simple as just kind of writing down uh, your gratitude every day or thoughts from the end of the day. It's it's interesting to me how powerful just writing down your thoughts along the journey can be. And um, I don't do it very consistently, but I do find I go into notes and when something comes to me, I just write it down. I'll go back and read some of that stuff 
you know, years later and I'm blown away at at something that that I thought about years ago, but my my perception of it today is so much more developed yeah. Yeah. and it's really interesting. And if somebody is building oh, that okay. over time, what a great resource to just develop something greater for the future. I'm glad it's not just me that hasn't been able to form that habit of, of journaling every day. I and mean, I've been trying to get into it. I can, uh, I'm on average maybe once every four or five days, but this is one of the biggest things that I'm trying to stack onto you know, kind of daily habits is getting it done. And, and for whatever reason, I've not been, you know, mature enough yet to form that habit, but I, I'll get there. I agree. It's huge value. And, and I always enjoy being able to go back and do it, but I have not been able to force myself to do it. So you're making me feel better. Yeah. I, f I fail at it all the time. I mean, I wrote down that I was going to meditate for like four years as one of my goals in my life model. And I, I had laid out the objective to meditate. And uh, I mean, I, I genuinely right. never, could find the time I'm, yes. again could find the time right. as a joke but i got right. to one minute then i got to five minutes then it turned into more prayer and spiritual time and you know all these things and now i've been able to stack so right. many things if i looked back five years from now at what i do today in a morning routine it would I, i'd be like there's no time <laughs> for that and um <laughs> yep. and so the journaling is something i've never been good at i've never been able and I, there's probably something internally that i haven't like just I flip the switch on, but, um, it is something I'd like to do. Maybe it's just the pace of life. When you have teenagers, when you have, you know, young children as well, yep. there's a lot going on and there's sometimes you're just tired yep. and you already have a lot to do. And you look at it as a job versus something that, um, mm -hmm. maybe is a release and I've got to flip the the script on it to maybe be something that I know I'm getting more out of. I don't, yeah. I don't know that. I don't know the solution. We have to do it though. Look, can we talk for a second about the the Chesapeake Wine Festival? So, if I if I'm counting right, this is the fifteenth year of it. Is that right? Yeah, fifteenth fifteenth year, and we had one year of COVID. We didn't have it, so it's the fourteenth that we actually are doing it. But it is the fifteenth year since we started it. And I was thinking about this when you were talking about your community um, impact yep. and the the fact that uh, when I started this in uh 2010 i guess 2009 2010 we um i i when we finished this we, we donated one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars to charity all local wow. charities that year um it was 25 to 30 virginia wineries virginia at the time is the fifth largest wine producer in the states so huge uh impact as far as the wine that. industry it's really good for wine so Virginia is extremely underrated wine, yeah. very, very good developing uh, markets, better and better every year comes so far, but you're giving all the wineries a chance to get their, their, their product out to people. Number one, number two, we had, I'd been to a bunch of wine events, but I'd never been to one that was all for charity. So the city of Norfolk did one, the city of Virginia beach did one, but I was like, what if we did one that was actually just for charity? And, you know, it became a, a second career for the first couple of years. And I, wow. I was able to do it. I was able to co-chair it with an uncle of mine who is a, is my, my godmother's husband who I know really well. Now we're, we're great friends, not only uh, oh. family today, but he had been very successful in business and we combined to really start to build something much bigger than ourselves. And um, there is a, there's something special year one, not only giving that money. I, I used to tell myself, gosh, I'll never be able to give. I used, I, I remember year one, I'll never be able to write a check for $175,000 in my brain. This is what I said. But if I can keep doing this, I can make a, a major impact. We've donated over two and a half million dollars to charity through wow. multiple events. We've, we've seeded other events that are now functioning and operating in other, other areas and um that we gave them the recipe and helped build it and they've now crossed over a million dollars and so to your point it, it goes right into the the point of of the building thought leadership focus on impact not ego i actually got the most out of it i remember actually having a challenge that the year that we created this where i was yeah. like i don't know that i don't want to do this the rest of my life like do i just do i want to stop this is so much more powerful and yep. the, the real change came when I flipped it and I said, wait a second, I can do both. Here's how I can blend both my career and this together, just wow. like you're doing in the community, just like <laughs> you mentioned earlier. And so um, we're we're in the 15th year, 14th of actually servicing. We have, um, you know, 20 to 
30 Virginia wineries. We bring out about 20 to 30 international wines that we taste from a, a wine distributor um, wine bow that we work with. Back. Phenomenal wines from around the world. And, and I took a hobby, something that I really love and built it around local businesses, yeah. local charities. And, and uh, it's really, yeah. really a great <laughs> fun day. And it's only one day. Uh, people have always asked us to do a, a weekend, a, a long time festival. I'm right. like, I can't, I can't, I can't even imagine doing it for more than one day. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, props on that. I mean, to, to me, the, it's got enough momentum now where it sounds like it's really self propelling, which is awesome. But, but getting over that hump from, all right, here's an idea that I have for this and then actually executing it, you know, all those years ago and in, in a buck 75 in year one is, is ridiculous. So, so congrats, man. What a, what a legacy with that. That that goes to uh, being around the right people, right. right? I mean, if you to your point about being in high school and surrounding yourself with leaders and asking the right questions and and taking people to lunch, like you mentioned, these are things that um, how many young people have great ideas, but they're sitting around a circle with a bunch of high and drunk friends mm -hmm. who are are going to tell you it's stupid mm -hmm. or laugh at you. And, and you know that it's a great idea and then you sit on it or you miss the opportunity. Instead, I was a 29 year old joining a rotary club with all older men that, that, I, that did not really look and feel like me at the time. Mm -hmm. But my uncle had told me, Hey, I think you should join this. And he was the catalyst to get me in. And so I joined this, this group. And I remember the first event I went to was a spaghetti dinner. And that's where this came from. I was blown away that all these leaders in our community who were like, the movers and shakers, people I had looked up to for, you know, 10 years in business were, were doing the worst event I had ever seen in my life. It was a disappointment. It was, it was horrible. The event was horrible <laughs> and it was spaghetti. And I grew up with a Sicilian grandmother. Like oh, this wasn't man. even real pasta and sauce. Yep. So the point I'm getting at is, you know, being around the right people helped to, to bridge that idea to execution. And I'm only partially responsible for it. I just got the, I had the pleasure of being in the right room with the right people, with the right leaders who helped the idea and my youth mold into something much different. And, and, um, you know, today the company, Mike, our company is very involved in it and our employees are very involved in it. And our, our staff does some of the marketing and some of the branding and we're, we need to shake it up. This is a year where we're, uh, I have a young guy who's uh, who come over and he was like, dude, your Instagram page is beat. It's time to it's time to <laughs> stop with the old old pictures. And so we, we're going to upgrade. 15 years is a long time to be doing something. That's for it sure. Is. It is. That's awesome, man. That's that's awesome. Rusty, tell me what's what's next in your life as we wrap this up. Tell me what's what's left. What's what's the next chapter for you? And then I want I want you to give listeners after that a chance to find you to to follow you to 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 make sure they're a part of your journey and most importantly they buy your book and they learn from it well thanks i mean next step is just continuing to chase these kids around and and be the free uber that my wife and i are all over austin um building building businesses so growing zilker media alongside our team growing forbes books alongside the team there and then you know my big passion as i mentioned scott i love to get out and speak and so uh, keynoting, uh, leading workshops, helping people understand there's a way to do this, uh, that, you know, you don't have to quit your day job. You don't have to spend a bunch of money and there's a way to do it. That's both effective and fun. And so that side of it, I really love, you can go to rustyshelton.com and learn a little bit more about the speaking and the books there. And then books.forbes.com to learn more about that business. And then zilkermedia.com, which is our agents. Well, if you, if you, if you have been listening to this show, here's what you know. Uh, Rusty is absolutely a high performer. He's a high performer who believes in the very things that we define this show on love, impact, faith, and energy. And it's great to listen to someone who's not only talking about it, but actually doing it. And so I, I look forward to following you. I look forward to reading more of your books in the future. And, um, and if you, uh, if you have a chance, it's not the only book he's written. So I know that there's other stuff out there. Let's make sure we, we take a look at the whole library because I think you're putting out some really great stuff and I'm grateful for having you on the show. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.